Thank you very much, Elle. Um, obviously, it's a tough act to follow. Uh, there's no way I can speak with the same kind of passion as an actual Syrian who has family there. But, um, yeah, um, I would... I'm basically focusing on something a lot more narrow and and the the issue that I'm focusing on really is the question of democratic reform in Syria. So uh, this is where the uh, and and where this issue uh, sits within the broader narrative about the Syrian conflict. I did have about four slides, but I'm unable to find them. I could have sworn that I sent it to myself, but I don't know where they are. But um, really, it's just a bunch of quotations that I can read to you anyway. Um, so the seminar title, as you would have seen on, on Facebook, was uh, Four Years of Humanitarian Intervention. And this is basically a reference to all the forms of intervention into Syria over the past four years, from the sanctions on Syria, which Reem mentioned, to the arming and funding of the so-called moderate rebels that have been justified with a humanitarian pretext. Namely, that these interventions are needed to help the Syrian people overthrow a dictator and ultimately to bring about democracy for the Syrian people. Um, just recently, the US State Department announced that they would be providing an additional $70 million in funding for so-called moderate rebel groups fighting the Syrian government. Uh, the last uh, moderate rebel groups that they gave this type of funding to ended up joining ISIS. Um, I think it's called Harakat al Hazm. That's the name of the group. Uh, they ended up basically joining... No, it could have been Jabhat al-Nusra, actually. But uh, Jabhat al-Nusra, yeah. Um, but, yeah, I mean, they, they, they announced this additional funding, and the justification provided by U.S. State Department, U.S. State Department spokesperson Jane Psaki was that, and I quote, For four years, the Assad regime has answered Syrians' calls for freedom and reform with unrelenting brutality, authoritarianism, and destruction. As we have long said, Assad must go and be replaced through a negotiated political transition that is representative of the Syrian people. And it's not just the US government saying this. Uh, much, to the, much of the established Western left, to my shock and dismay many years ago, uh, basically fell in line with the US State Department's version of events regarding Syria. So take Noam Chomsky, who said the following in July 2013. He said, what happened in Syria is not outside our understanding. It began as a popular and democratic protest movement demanding democratic reforms, but instead of responding to it in a constructive, positive manner, Assad reacted with violent repression." Unquote. So this narrative that's been presented by the US State Department and by, uh, unfortunately, large sections of the Western left is largely inaccurate. The record shows that the government has actually largely addressed and implemented the popular demands for democratic reform, while predictably, as you'd expect of any government, resisted all attempts by the insurgency to overthrow the Syrian state. In reality, protests around legitimate grievances and calls for democratic reform were hijacked on this day four, day, four years ago by a violent insurgency seeking to overthrow the state. They were hijacked in the sense that the protests demanding reform were entirely different to the violent insurgency both in terms of their methods and also in terms of the type of society they wanted to create. I say this because the brand of Islamism, um, for lack of a better term, by the insurgency, uh, which seeks to establish a theocracy that does away with Syria's existing secular social order, has very little in common with the actual demands for democratic reform that we heard about in 2011. However, the Western corporate media often repeating the claims of Al Jazeera and Al Arabiya, uh, the Qatari and the Saudi um, news channels that have um, really put forward the American perspective on this and their own perspective on this because they too have vested interests in the overthrow of the Syrian state. Um, these outlets spoke about them as if they were essentially the same thing. That is, those wanting to overthrow the state on the one hand and those wanting reforms. They basically mish mashed them together and said that they were the same thing. For example, we know now, with the clarity of hindsight, that the majority killed in March 2011 were actually police officers and army personnel. This suggests, obviously, that the state was fighting an armed insurgency from day one. However, according to Al Jazeera, um, this 
uh, the events in March amounted to a bloody crackdown on protesters in Syria. In this way, the corporate media narrative spun the truth in such a way that the Islamist insurgents fighting for a theocracy were presented as an extension of the protest calling for democracy. In order to sustain this narrative, the actual democratic reforms that have been implemented, as well as the government's efforts to address the legitimate grievances of the Syrian people, have either been dismissed or completely ignored by the Western corporate media and by our leaders. Uh, the lesson here is, just because people oppose their government in terms of the way it's structured, or because they believe it has authoritar authoritarian features that have to be curtailed, this doesn't necessarily mean that they would then support the overthrow of the state. To be sure, leading to the outbreak of the war, there was popular discontent in Syria. This is undeniable. And the effects of drought, as well as the uh, gradual erosion of Syria's welfare state, resulted in increased corruption, increased inequality, more corporate cronyism, um, unemployment and, un and, and inflation. These were some of the, the, the perceived problems with the Syrian government from the standpoint of the Syrian population. Before the outbreak of the war, the government had already begun making concessions to address these issues. Again, these were largely ignored in the Western media. So subsidies for public sector workers were increased, uh, transfer payments were made to Syria's 420,000 poorest families, and the government began reducing taxes on basic food items. Uh, the demands also included easing the authoritarian features of the Syrian state. So on the 9th of February 2011, the ban on Facebook and YouTube were lifted. Uh, in terms of the popular demands for major structural changes, that is the structure of government and whatnot, uh, the question is what were the demands firstly? And to what extent did the government actually implement them? This is a question that's rarely ever even discussed. You can't discuss it in our political culture, unfortunately. The first major demand was for the emergency laws to be lifted. And these laws had been in place ever since the Ba'ath Party took power in 1963. The government gave in to this demand on the 20th of April 2011, so just a month after the insurgency started. President Assad basically issued an executive decree which lifted the state of emergency that had previously given the police sweeping powers to carry out preemptive arrests and detain suspects. President Assad also abolished the Supreme Secret Court, which, as the name suggests, allowed the state to trial those arrested under those uh, state of emergency type provisions. He also introduced new laws granting the right to peacefully protest. And it's also been reported that the um, demands of the protesters in the early part of, uh, of the conflict in 2011, and even before that, um, uh, was that they, they wanted an end to the Ba'ath Party's political monopoly, and they wanted the creation of a multi-party democratic system. So three months into the war, on the 20th of June 2011, President Assad announced a national dialogue to begin a process of constitutional reform. Uh, out of this dialogue, major changes were made to the Syrian constitution, and the new proposal was put to a constitutional referendum, uh, which asked the electorate if they approved of the changes that were mainly focused on getting rid of the Ba'ath Party's political monopoly. Um, so on the 26th of February 2012, uh, 8.4 million Syrians went to the polls, of whom 7.5 million voted yes for the new constitution. That means that 89% approved uh, approve the new constitution, and that's with a participation rate of 57%, which isn't much, but still, it's slightly more than, uh, than elections in the United States. Um, to give you a historical perspective about where all, how all of this started, in terms of the demand for reform in Syria, uh, Syria has been referred to as a dictatorship on the grounds that ever since 1963, uh, state power has effectively been controlled by the Ba'ath Party and also because power has, also, has always been concentrated at the executive level, executive level with the president and his cabinet. Uh, the Ba'ath Party operated by decree until 1973, um, and in 1973 a new constitution was voted in, uh, and it basically uh, reintroduced parliamentary elections, but it came with conditions. And this is like an element of, of Syria's uh, um, what's described as its dictatorial form of government that's, that's often cited. So the conditions were that only parties that the Ba'ath Party 
would accept as partners in a political front known as the National Progressive Front were allowed to participate in these elections. It also meant that candidates from outside of these political parties could only run as, as independents. They couldn't run as a part of their own political parties. Uh, and this is reflected in Article 8 of the old constitution, the 1973 constitution, which basically reads, the leading party in society and the state is the Arab Socialist Ba'ath Party. The new constitution introduced in 2012, when it was voted in by the Syrian people, um, introduced a multi-party political system in the sense that the eligibility of political parties to participate wasn't based on the discretionary permission of the Ba'ath Party. Instead, now, according to the new constitution, political parties are free to enter politics, so long as they're not based on religion, sect, or, or ethnicity, and so long as they don't promote discrimination on the basis of gender or race. So, on the 7th of May 2012, uh, the parliamentary elections went ahead, according to these new laws that had uh, resulted in a new constitution. So, a new coalition of parties called the Popular Front for Change and Liberation ran against the Ba'ath Party-led National Progressive Front. Uh, for this election, 10.1 million Syrians were registered to vote out of a population of 23 million, of whom 5.2 million Syrians voted. The results were that the National Progressive Front won with 168 seats. Their, their opponents, um, their political party opponents, I should say, the, uh, the Popular Front for Change and Liberation won five seats, and the rest were, were taken up by independents who made up the 77 um, other seats. And in all, the 250 seats were divided amongst eight political parties and 77 independents, uh, independent candidates. So the new constitution also introduced multi-candidate presidential elections. So according to the old 1973 constitution, the Ba'ath Party would nominate its own candidate for office in an uncontested referendum, um, in which the electorate were asked a simple yes or no question of whether they approved of the candidate for president. This is the system, system under, which the, under which Bashar al-Assad won the presidential elections in 2000 and then in 2007, and under which um, the former president, Hafez al-Assad, won numerous elections after the Ba'ath Party took power. Um, but if hypothetically, I mean this is like a hypothetical, uh, if hypothetical, the, hypothetically this referendum failed to receive a majority of votes, the People's Council, which is Syria's unicameral pa uh, parliament, kind of like our parliament, but they've only got one, we've got two, because we've got a bicameral system, um, uh, then they would have the right to propose another candidate. Um, so, according to the new constitution, this is where the changes have come in, uh, presidential candidates are nominated by the People's Council, uh, so by their actual parliament. So to qualify as a candidate, the applicant must have the support of at least 35 members of the People's Council and must have lived in Syria for the past 10 years. If hypothetically only one candidate qualifies within these rules, the Speaker of the People's Council calls for a repeat of those procedures so they can potentially get more candidates. So according to these new rules, a presidential election was held on the 3rd of June 2014. It was contested between three candidates who qualified, and one of them being President Assad. And of the 15.8 million Syrians eligible to vote out of a population of 23 million, 11.6 million Syrians voted, of whom 10.3 million Syrians voted for the incumbent, President Assad. Uh, that's with a participation rate of 73%, and uh, President Assad won with a, a winning vote of 88%. Um, so just to recap, there have been three major stages to Syria's internal democratic reforms. Firstly, there, were the, there was a constitutional referendum, which eliminated, um, which sorry, which created an equal playing field for all political parties, uh, which eliminated uh, privileges for the Ba'ath Party, and which allowed multi-party presidential elections. And this was then followed by parliamentary and presidential elections that were run according to uh, to the new constitution. So, how has the world responded to these reforms? Um, well, international observers from countries representing the majority of the world's population, so we're talking about uh, Russia, China, India especially, um, along with a number of other countries that monitored the elections in Syria, basically said the same thing, that the elections were free, fair and transparent. The only criticisms of the elections came from countries that either didn't send observers, 
or the countries that are actively complicit in sponsoring the anti-government insurgency. Take Saudi Arabia and Qatar, for example, which are both monarchies, therefore dictatorships by definition. They issued a statement denouncing the elections as illegitimate. Or take the United Kingdom's Foreign Secretary, uh, William Hague, who lectured uh, Syria saying, this election bore no relation to genuine democracy. And mind you, this is from someone representing a country with an unelected head of state, the Queen, who's also our head of state, uh, and with an unelected House of Lords. And yet, nobody questions, especially in the Western media, the credibility of democracy in the United Kingdom. But they question Syria's democracy. And so what does this ultimately mean? It means that the Western corporate media didn't immediately... Um, well, I mean, that the Western corporate media didn't immediately point to the sheer hypocrisy of this statement gives you an idea of how propagandized our political culture is and how many double standards we as a society have internalized. Uh, the lesson to, to learn here is that we, living here in the so-called West, have to be aware of the dichotomy that we're presented between dictatorships and democracies, um, that they're often based on the interests and the foreign policy of our government, and Syria is no different. If we accepted that a state is democratic to the extent that it represents the wishes of its, of its people, um, then there's another side to Syria's historical narrative that's worth mentioning, which is that prior to this war, Syria was a country that had the fourth lowest per capita GDP when compared to its fellow Arab states. However, it ranked third highest in life expectancy, which was around 74 years. The only countries that did better than Syria in life expectancy, this is before the war, half a page, I promise, which is before the war, were, uh, were Qatar and the UAE. So um, just to give you an idea, I mean, Syria, prior to the war, had a per capita income of $2,000. I mean, Qatar, by comparison, is $90,000, and the UAE is $42,000. So by all standards of human development, such as education, healthcare, and women's rights, Syria did, a far, far, did far better than its income level. Um, that the government has implemented all these reforms, um, and that 73% of the Syrian electorate voted in the presidential elections suggests two things. One, that the majority of Syrians support their government and oppose the insurgency. And two, that the insurgency was never about democratizing the state. Um, so yeah, how much? Am I over 15? Okay. So you know what? I'll leave it at that. I had a few more sentences, but uh, thank you.